Good afternoon, and welcome to the Middle East Forums webinar and podcast series featuring discussions from Middle East Forums projects. My name is Benjamin Baird, and I am the Deputy Director of Islamist Watch, a project of the Middle East Forum. I'll be your host today for the next 30 minutes as we are joined by our esteemed guest, Dr. Richard Benkin, who's here to, to discuss Jewish and Hindu solidarity in the face of Islamist opposition. Dr. Benkin's human rights work began in 2003 when his relentless advocacy helped free a Bangladeshi journalist wrongfully in prison for fighting radical Islam and encouraging relations with Israel. Since 2008, he's been fighting to stop the ethnic cleansing of Bangladeshi Hindus, convincing the U.S. Foreign House Foreign Affairs Committee to hold hearings on the matter in 2016, and eventually getting the Bangladeshi government to admit its history of anti-Hindu persecution. His book, A Quiet Case of Ethnic Cleansing, The Murder of Bangladesh's Hindus, details those atrocities and the world's silent complicity. If you stick around for the second half of this webinar, you'll get the opportunity to ask Dr. Benkin and myself questions about this topic. Just please use the Q&A button found at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to get to as many of these as we can. So without any more delay, let's get right to it. Dr. Benkin, thank you for being here. My, My first pleasure. question. Thank you. thank you. My first question, which may be on the minds of many of our viewers, uh, Jews are one of the most persecuted and demonized groups in the world. They've certainly got enough to handle protecting their own. Why should Jewish Americans spend their energy worrying about the treatment of Hindus in South Asia or anywhere else for that matter? Well, for, first, it's, it's horrible what's happening to them. And just as we did not appreciate it when others sat by idly as our people were being murdered and exterminated, uh, similarly, we shouldn't be guilty of the same crime. However, beyond that, um, we uh, have similar values and we face the same adversaries. We face the same wall of contempt, of bigotry, and of sound bites that try to minimize our uh, common persecution. Right. So it sounds like Jews and Hindus face many of the same political circumstances in the way of persecution, as you mentioned. That much is very clear. You also said that there are some values that Jews and Hindus share. Uh, for instance, uh, Jews and Hindus are two of the world's oldest religions. Um, they are often associated with particular ethnic groups. Um, they don't tend to seek converts like Christianity uh, and, and Islam. Uh, what are some other values and traits that they share? Well, I think uh, that that the uh that the point, you, the point you made about the not seeking converts really opens the door to the, the essence of, of what unites us in, in value terms. Ben, you're absolutely right. Uh, in our millennia, uh, old histories uh, for both of us, we don't seek converts. Um, we feel that the best way to uh, uh, advertise our, our faith, so to speak, is to be good models. And uh, if people want to join us, let them join us sincerely. And the key before they do in both cases, learn, 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 learn. Great. Um, so, you know, it sounds like with these through these shared values and histories that Hindus and Jews make for natural allies, especially here in the U.S. where they're facing persecution uh, from Islamists and their enablers. Um, we know that Islamists, for instance, are often part of very large progressive coalitions that include uh, liberal Jewish and Hindu groups. Is there an equivalent among this? Is there a Jewish and Hindu coalition group or any sort of uh, uh, formal grassroots nonprofit civil society organization that brings Jews and Hindus together currently in the United States? You know, there's several efforts. Uh, there's no grand organization, but for instance, uh, I work uh, very closely now with the Hindu American Foundation, which is much more activist than it was some years ago. Yeah. And uh, uh, they, they are as sympathetic uh, to our situation as, as we are to them. Uh, as part of uh, Stand With Us here in Chicago, uh, we've uh, developed an, a number of, uh, of, of uh, groups with, uh, with Hindus. No grand alliance yet, but a lot of working groups. That's great to hear. Well, let's talk about the other side then for a minute. Uh, American Islamist groups are actively seeking to undermine uh, Jewish and Hindu, the Jewish and Hindu American agenda here in the United States. Um, why do they find a common enemy in Jews and Hindus, and who are these Islamist organizations? Uh, well, first of all, you don't have to be a special Islamist uh, group to hate Jews and Hindus. Uh, sure. 
He, that's going to run through all of them. Uh, what concerns me here, if you're talking about here, I mean, in, in South Asia, for instance, you'll, you'll have the formal group, Islamist groups. What concerns me here is what Daniel Pipes for decades has called uh, legal Islamism. And that is uh, by individuals finding a way to get into uh, a position of power and, in fact, continuing to have, as you referred to once for enablers in, in this. And, you know, and, and I'm sure MEF finds this too. You know, I find this uh, that them all over the government, in, in in all sorts of positions where they have the ability to um, uh, emphasize a particular narrative that's friendly to their cause and an unfriendly to ours. Sure. So, you know, so these are Islamist organizations. Some of them are Indian Muslim organizations. Some of them are purely Muslim American organizations. We're talking about groups like the Council on American Islamic Relations the Indian American Muslim uh, Council, uh, Stand with Kashmir, Friends with Kashmir, all of these groups, they've been very active with efforts around the country. Um, after they failed at the federal level to sort of get Congress to grab onto resolutions uh, vilifying India and, and accusing it of human rights abuses, uh, they started a new tactic, which was to go after progressive groups or progressive cities across the country, progressive governments, and convince them to, to pass the same resolutions, which essentially uh, accused the BJP majority government uh, of being a Hindutva group, uh, which uh, basically persecutes the, the Muslim minority in that country, which is the world's largest democracy. Um, can you tell me a little bit, then they got to Chicago, uh, where there was a bit of a different result. Can you tell me a little bit about how Jews and Hindus came together in Chicago, which is your city, uh, yeah. to fight these resolutions? Absolutely, Ben. Thanks for asking. So, you know, I'm very excited about what happened. As you mentioned, this, this resolution which had been passed in six cities so far, and the most progressive cities like Seattle, I think it's the uh, number one, um, and Chicago appeared to be number seven e easily. However, uh, we do have that growing group, just as in the Jewish community and the Hindu community, of people who have started to see that progressive politics aren't necessarily for them. And so um, that group uh, decided, no, they were, they were going to stop this. It was, a, it was a scurrilous. And besides, with all the problems we have here in Chicago, what the heck does our city council have time to, to talk about India? Um, and so um, one of the leaders of the uh, this Hindu community uh, in Chicago, uh, Dr. Bharat Bharai, a longtime friend and supporter of, of uh, us, and probably been to Israel more than either of us, um, he reached out to me and asked if the Jewish community can help, and uh, we did. We did. We all, so many of us got on the phones, made calls, uh, went to uh, members of the city council, and in the end, though this was expected to pass, in the end it was defeated. It, 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 and, and even Mayor Lori Lightfoot had uh, uh, issued a uh, proclamation at one point earlier, which uh, was uh, negative towards that. So uh, we worked together. And I will mention one other thing that uh, after the vote, Dr. Bright called me and said his person on the council told him that these same people, and this also a good, good point to uh, your first question, uh, sure. these same people were planning to introduce an anti-Israel resolution. And Dr. Bry then followed up by saying, just as you stood with us, the Hindu community will stand with you. Well, that's great to hear that uh, Jews and Hindus came together in Chicago. That was a great testing ground, uh, I believe, for the type of solidarity that can be shown across the country and certainly on the national level. I do want to mention that the Middle East Forum was a part of fighting that resolution through its counter-Islamist grid project, uh, which organized to have its activists take part in protests and start a letter writing campaign that resulted in 12,000 constituent letters, uh, mostly from Hindu Americans living in Chicago uh, that, that sent letters to the city council talking about how, look, this is an Islamist resolution. It is the brainchild of groups that want to see Sharia law established in India that are part of dangerous secessionist movements in that country. Um, and you know the counter-Islamist grid is run uh, similar letter writing campaigns in the past, but none have had this kind of response. There were uh, city aldermen in Chicago who said that they could not complete their daily right. business because they were just overwhelmed with phone calls and letters. Uh, what do you think accounts for this political enthusiasm among Hindu Americans in Chicago and around the country? Well, 
Uh, I, I, uh, I, I think there are a couple. If you go back, at, if you recognize that the vast majority of Hindu Americans either immigrated from or are children of uh, or grandchildren of immigrants from India. And uh, uh, in, in India, particularly under the previous government prior to uh, Narendra Modi, uh, there was a real, real strong ethic not to uh, emphasize Hinduism, not to defend Hinduism, but in fact, to spend your efforts, if, if you're going to spend them at all, spend them on helping others. Uh, sounds great, but as, as, as you know, the, the, uh, what, what actually resulted was not great. Anyway, what we're seeing now is more of an American-born Hindu population. Besides that, the Hindu population is growing. It's becoming stronger. Just as I, you know, I mentioned, the Hindu American Foundation, they've become so much stronger, more activists in, in, in the last year. And I know uh, they also work with Middle East Forum uh, on issues. So I think those two things have a lot to do with I think, you know, I really think there was uh, uh, another uh, factor in that. It was just, this is enough, enough of this crap. We've had right. to deal with this song. We need to take a stand. And in fact, that's what they did. And they were smart enough to say, let's ally uh, on this and on future issues. Right. I know uh, there was quite a bit of frustration from the community there. You know, in other cities where similar resolutions were passed, uh, you know, they were pushed forward quite quickly. Uh, and the, the local communities didn't have time to react. In Chicago, they benefited from the resolution uh, experiencing several delays, which allowed, I think, the type of grassroots opposition to form. Um, and that just speaks to the important, importance of staying up on what local government is doing uh, to, to pass these sort of resolutions and, and legislation. Um, so that's great to hear. Now, this isn't just the Jewish, Jewish Americans helping out Hindu Americans. This is a two-way street, of course. Uh, have Hindu Americans recently answered the call when it comes to, for instance, Israel and anti-Semitism. Uh, yes, and I, I'll tell you what, I could take up a lot of time with specific I know you don't want them, but they really have. I want, I want to emphasize one thing. Sure. During, during the most recent conflict between Israel and Hamas, we didn't have stronger advocates for Israel mm -hmm. than the American Hindu community. Uh, I was at Jewish rallies uh, for Israel, where there were more Hindu speakers than Jewish speakers. Um, there are very large entirely Hindu rallies for Israel. And I, uh, I mentioned back this several years ago, during another conflict, there was a rally of 70,000 Hindus in the city of Kolkata for Israel. So yeah, uh, we, we, yeah we, we, we do get a lot of support from them. I think what our job is, is to make sure we contact them, make sure they're aware of what's going on because we do have, have allies in the uh, Hindu community. Right. Look, uh, I, now I want to point to, for one second, and I'm going to share my screen here. Uh, the Islamophobia Studies Center, which is an organization based in Berkeley, Cal uh, California, as you can see here, they've come up with a report called Israel, Israel, India, and the Islamophobic Alliance. It's by Richard Silverstein. See that there? Uh, So it, it speaks of a grand Hindutva Zionist alliance, which is led in part by, they claim, Middle East Forum founder Daniel Pipes, whose supposed goal is, quote, nothing less than the subjugation of a world religion with 1.8 billion adherents. So what do you say to critics who view Jewish and Hindu solidarity as steeped in fascism and religious supremacy? Well, first of all, any one of us, anyone who knows Dr. Pipes and is familiar with his work over decades knows that that's a slander with absolutely no basis in fact. And I think that that really is the key. Our adversaries love sound bites. They don't need fact to back it up. Um, we try and work with facts. Well, that, that takes a lot more to, to actually convince people. But I think that, it, I, and I, I, so yes, I, I would say what you need to know, and I've seen this close up, this is, this is our enemy's worst nightmare worst nightmare. They're fine if we're divided, if we each sure. stay in our own little silo and don't really help the other. And this, this really scares them. I, I know this for a fact. Beyond that, I've heard this slander before for years when I would speak at universities in India, particularly under the previous government prior to Narendra Modi. 
uh, I would be picketed and protested by people who, because I would come with my Hindu friends, would declare, oh, this is a great Zionist Hindu Twa conspiracy to oppress the Muslims. Sure. It, 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 it's, it's an old slander. It didn't have any, any uh, base, in fact, then. It has none now. But it's a sound bite that people who are ignorant of mm -hmm. the realities will just glom onto, especially if some of their favorite uh, progressives seem to uh, favor it as well. Right. So, and I guess I should have asked this first. What is uh, Hindutva? For our uh, maybe viewers who are unfamiliar with the term, it's used, thrown about quite loosely by uh, the Islamist opposition and, and their enablers. Uh, what is Hindutva and is it, uh, is, is it popular in India? Does it have a large number of adherents? Yeah, I mean, more than, to, to, without getting into all the you know, formalities, what it really is, it's, it's a philosophy mm. that holds that Hindus should be proud of being Hindus, that Hinduism should fight back, and that's necessarily, not necessarily figure, but to always oppose uh, bigotry against Hindus, and that Hindus should recognize that Hindus and India are a significant factor in, in this world, and that they should not expect the world to act as if, as if they weren't. That's, mm -hmm. I think, a, a, a good sense of, uh, of what it is. And mm -hmm. yeah, so in, in, in that way, there's, there's really nothing uh, sinister about it. Sure. Nothing inherently hateful in it. Oh, not, not at all. In fact, again, you look at Hinduism, just as you look at Judaism, and I defy you to right. find that hate uh, as we might elsewhere. It's just not there. Thank you. Uh, okay, so we've reached about our halfway point here. I'm gonna go ahead and ask a couple questions from our audience. This one coming from Jeffrey Sheff. He asks, is the connection between Jews and Hindus in the US dependent upon relations between Israel and India? It's a great question. Um, I don't think so, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Uh, these efforts that we saw started coming to the surface uh, prior to Narendra Modi's uh, election, and we all know, look, with, with his election in 2013, relations between India and Israel really flourished. There mm -hmm. had been some before, but Israel, India generally voted against India, Israel at the UN. So, I, as I said, it bubbled to the surface prior to that. Whether I don't think it's dependent on, but I can, I mean, I can tell you the fact that India and Israel works closely to get so closely and publicly together really has helped uh, galvanize these, these relations. I want to also mention something else that what people don't realize is even prior to this public embrace between these uh, two, two nations, um, Israel, Israel continued to, to uh, give a lot of assistance, particularly in the security and intelligence areas to India, such as I remember some people who are involved in, uh, uh, from, 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 the, uh, from Israel who were involved in the aftermath of the 2611 terrorist attack in Mumbai, India, which really helped India uh, take care of uh, the aftermath. Thank you for that answer. Uh, we have another one here from an anonymous attendee who asks, I'd assume that connections between Baha'i and Jews would also be beneficial due to the persecution of Baha'i by Iran and the tomb of the Bab in Haifa. I agree. You agree with that, thank you. Uh, Jeffrey Sheff also asks, is the polytheist Hindu faith a barrier when it comes to connections between religious Jews and Hindus? Okay, well, uh, Jim, I gotta tell you, I, I find that kind of a curious question. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm not uh, attacking your motives at all, but I find it curious because um, if we're gonna call, you know, without getting into too detailed of philosophy, actually the Hindus got, Hindu gods and goddesses are all manifestation of actually one one God. Um, that's it's generally not put that way, but it's the same as if we call if we call a, a Jewish Christian cooperation problematic. Because is that a polytheistic faith? Faith again, if you get into uh, the the theology, uh, you, you you can uh, uh, dispute that. However, I will also tell you one other thing. When I was a kid, when I was a kid in my religious school, and it was pr pretty intense, I learned and I learned again and again that the only two truly monotheistic faiths on the planet were Judaism and, and Islam. 
Mm -hmm. Does that suggest that that's our best uh, avenue for cooperation? I, I, I'm not sure it does. So uh, the poly, polytheistic nature, as, as you put it, of, of um, Hinduism, I, I, I think is a lot more complex than that. And finally, in the things I've been involved with, it has not been a barrier, even among uh, quite observant uh, Jews. Well, that's definitely good to hear. Uh, we have another question from Sam Westrup who is the director of the Islamist Watch Project. Yeah. He notes that these days, groups such as American Muslims for Palestine seem to spend half their time speaking not about Israel, but about India. This is a relatively new development. And then he asks, what do you think the ideological reasons are for Western Islamism switching or expanding focus to India and Kashmir? Why now and not 20 years ago? Is it just angry at Modi's newest policies or is it about changes within Western Islamism's own thinking? Does it have anything to do with Pakistani regime's outreach to Western Muslims? He, he, he notes that clearly something has changed, but what is the big change to precipitate all of this recently? First of all, I gotta, Sam, I, I read your stuff all the time. It's fantastic. So thank you for, for all, that, all that you do. Uh, yeah, I, you know, uh, again, when I mentioned before, we have the same adversaries. The same people that have a thing about Israel have a thing about India. And I think part of it does have to do with the change in regimes in 2013. Uh, the previous uh, regime, uh, the Congress Party UPA coalition, was, I guess the best way to describe it was it, it sort of was a, um, a, a soft uh, European socialist wannabe. And uh, whereas, um, and, and, Many of the people in the uh, in the Islamist camp uh, fall into that progressive, or they, they work with that progressive uh, uh, group, and they see socialism good, capitalism bad. So I think that's definitely part of it. Uh, I think so. I, I think it's it's yes. Uh, you know, he, when when Modi first ran in 2013, I wrote an article. His party was about to uh, nominate the left's favorite whipping boy. So that was always there in in India. So I think once he got once he got into the position. Uh, they saw something that was, one, scary to them, because, uh, as you know, Modi's been a very strong prime minister, but two, it's an opportunity because it sits with their narrative. I think there are a lot of factors that can add that, that, that can add to this. Uh, we also can add, well, we can, can note one thing, that as India has become more prominent geopolitically, and certainly as it became a stronger U.S. ally, right. uh, uh, during the Trump administration especially, uh, but even before and, and, and now, um, it was, it was a much juicier target, especially if they wanted people to glom on who just love to beat up the United States as well. Mm. Can I ask very briefly, uh, you mentioned that Modi, there was some cooperation between Modi and the Trump government. Should we expect the same uh, from the Biden administration? And in fact, should we expect the Biden administration who has appointed many Pakistani Americans and South Asians to uh, top level administrative positions should we expect him to buy into the Islamist narrative that uh, India, the world's largest democracy, is also uh, one of the worst offenders of religious persecution? Um, yeah, I, I, uh, for, first of all, I do not believe that a, a Biden foreign policy is Obama 2.0. Anyone who has followed and, and know Joe Biden and knows him for over these decades knows he, he's developed his own very strong uh, opinion and beliefs. Obviously, as vice president, if he had any objections to what Obama was doing, he would he would express them privately. And then he had the choice to either support what the president did or resign. We, and we know what he did. I believe the greatest danger we have, because I don't think that uh, Biden buys into the narrative himself. I think what the problem is, he has to negotiate with a growing, uh, for lack of a better word, progressive fact faction among, in his party, among the people that are going to elect Congress, members of Congress and the Senate who will be able to pass his legislation. He has to deal with that. And he has to have, somehow find a way uh, to uh, uh, mollify them without empowering them. That's not easy. Is he up to it? I really don't know. Uh, we'll have to see. Certainly, uh, you know, uh, a lot of the people that have been appointed, as you point out, Ben, uh, you know, are problematic. Now, exactly uh, uh, what force they'll have in, in administration decisions remains yet to be seen. Certainly, I think it does remain to be seen. Uh, George, George Goldberg points out that you state that they love sound bites and we use facts. His question, 
Why can't we produce both facts and fact-based sound bites? And why don't we pay more attention to sound bites? Well, it's kind of funny because I was in several discussions today and uh, this week on that very, very issue. So, I mean, you've got it exactly right in asking that question uh, because, you know, what you want to do when you push uh, a, a position uh, in Washington is first you want to get people's attention. How do you get their attention? You get with sound bites. You start overwhelm, overwhelming them with data and, and you lose them. So, yeah, I think sound bites are, are, I don't know, I don't supposedly, you know, we control the media and we're all in public relations. Uh, uh, but for whatever reason, uh, we haven't been very good at sound bites. And there are some great sound bites uh, that right. both India and Israel. And of course, uh, those of us who in the United States that uh, believe in strong relations with those countries uh, can can bring to bear. So good question and good point. Yeah, it's definitely interesting what works uh, as far as grassroots advocacy. You know, what may work for a Democratic Progressive Alliance doesn't always work for conservatives, uh, doesn't always work for even nonpartisan groups. Uh, you know, and I think taking advantage of the media space is, is very important. Uh, a recent report came out to show how successful conservative groups were uh, at social media shares online. I think they particularly pointed to the Daily Wire. And I think that's something that uh, that different groups need to take advantage of. Yeah. Okay, I, sure. No, I, I, I was just going to say that, uh, uh, again, um, when we were working in Washington, uh, you just face these sound bites all the time. And uh, that that is probably could what until we get past that, it's really hard for people to understand the data within a context where it makes sense. And we have had some victories, but uh, we, we still have a lot of work to do. Right. I think when it comes to the, uh, the issue of India and Hinduism versus Islamism, it's so steeped in internal Indian politics. Uh, that you really have to be up on these matters to know who's telling the truth, who's who's giving you uh, the the accurate narrative here. You, you have to look into these issues. The media isn't always uh, uh, forthcoming and, and uh, honest about uh, what's going on in that country, and I think that leads to a lot of disinformation here. Yes, wow. a absolutely, and. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, when we were at the, the uh, International Religious Freedom Summit, uh, we had someone stand up at our, and ask a question at our, uh, our session on, on uh, Bangladeshi Hindus, in which, again, he pointed the finger at India. And when I responded by saying, OK, here's how many people recently have been slaughtered in Bangladesh for the religious belief, and how many, been, how many have been slaughtered in India? And of course, if there are any, you can count them on your hand. Uh, but his response is, well, my pastor was abducted by the government. Whether oh. it's true or not doesn't matter, but that's a soundbite. That's all he cared about. He didn't care right. about the numbers. Right. The big picture, I suppose, is out of context. Absolutely. Uh, Jay Lewis asks, he, he compliments you on being a very good speaker, and he asks, uh, which is something we probably should have mentioned earlier, uh, Dr. Benkin, are you Jewish or Hindu or neither? <laughs> I'm very proud to be Jewish. I'm not only very proud to be Jewish, I am a very proud Zionist. Ah, okay, thank you for that. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks, Jewish Americans primarily vote Democratic, and I believe that's true uh, as much as 80%. What about Hindu Americans? It, it's very, very similar. You know, the, the, default, the default vote is Democrat, just as it is in, in the Jewish community. And that's why, you know, it's been a lot of work developing uh, these coalitions and, and, uh, and, and getting people to buy, you know, buy into this. Um, so it, it, it's very similar. It's another, another thing we share. So those of us fighting the good fight uh, are facing the same sort of uh, headwinds. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Saul Khan asks, recently read about aggression in India by Hindus against Christians. Uh, he asked if this is true, and if so, why? Aggressive proselytizing by the latter or something else? Yeah, the, you know, the, there's, a, uh, there's a real big concern about proselytizing, and I don't want to appear to be taking a side. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just going to try and, and uh, be as, as objective as I can. There is a real concern about proselytizing in, in India. Uh, if you talk to people in India, I think uh, they'll tell you a lot about that was the whole... Uh, 
Uh, that, that, was, that was the whole effort of the British Raj, who occupied India for so long. And before then, it was Muslims. It was the Mughal Empire. Sure. So Hindus have always been subject to that. And so there's a great deal of distrust regarding that. I want to mention something else very briefly. That is another headwind we face because we often talk about the progressive left and, and that the more, we'll have more support on, on the right side of the ledger. Uh, one of the problems for uh, Hindus and for those of us that work and certainly for uh, uh, my issue of, of uh, the Bangladeshi Hindus is that many of the people that you would expect to uh, be supportive of this have very large constituencies who have promoted uh, that, uh, that, that uh, false propaganda that India is, uh, is, is inhospitable to, uh, to Christians. Sure. Yeah, before we go over too much on time here, I do want to mention that there was recently a Pew uh, survey which showed that as much as I, for, for all religious groups were asked if they were free to practice the religion in India, and even Muslim Americans, I believe uh, the, the answer was in the high 80s percentile. Uh, and the same was definitely true of Christians and Hindus. Great point, uh, thank you. Yes, yeah, so we've come to the close of our webinar. Thank you, Dr. Benkin for joining us today. Can you let us know maybe where we can find uh, some more of your work? Uh, yes, uh, my website is interfaithstrength.com. Okay, it's all one word, interfaith strength. Uh, and uh, if you, uh, you can always Google me, you'll find some stuff. You'll probably find some uh, criticism and slanders on me, but that's fine too. I kind of take that as a badge of pride. Um, or you can also, uh, if you can't find this, uh, you could email me. Uh, do you want me to put the email in the chat? I don't mind uh, doing it. It's pretty public. Yeah, certainly. Put the email in the chat. We'll, we'll share it with our audience. I'll also put the website you. again. Uh, the website's a good idea, but if you, if you have both, um, yeah. I think you'll be able to find uh, a lot of stuff that uh, you'd have, but I'm also very happy to answer questions, you know, and such that people ask. Uh, okay, got that. And well, thank you, Dr. Uh, Bankin, for that. Uh, for our viewers and listeners, please be on the lookout for our weekly webinar offerings found in your email over the weekend. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to meforum.org for the latest articles, press releases, and webinars. Thank you for joining us today, and I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Thanks again Thank to you. Dr. Benkin. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, MEF. Take care, everyone.